then started. Okay. Uh, here's my line. And let's get started with today's material. So today's material now, uh, last week, we just did a review of homework. So you remember what we did last week. Last week we did, uh, talked about the most important theorem in all of computation theory, which is the division theorem. Which basically says, if you want to take A divided by B, if A and B are integers, such that B is a positive number, where B is greater than zero, then there exist unique integers, Q and R, such that A is equal to Q, B plus R, where zero is less than or equal to R is less than B, right? That's the theorem from last week that we used over and over again. Most important number, most important theorem in number theory. We're going to use that all throughout this chapter. Now, the next theorem we're going to talk about in number theory, or the next concept we're going to talk about, is the greatest common divisor. Going back to grade school, the greatest common divisor of two numbers. Uh, give you a quick example. What's the greatest common divisor of... Uh, 21 and 9. Six, three, three. Three. Three is the biggest number that goes into both of those evenly, right? Mm -hmm. What's the greatest common divisor of 28 and 21? Seven. 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 Seven is the biggest number that goes into both of those, etc. Greatest common divisor. That's all we need. So let's get into our definition. If A, B, and D are all integers, such that D divides A and D divides B, then D is a common divisor of A and B. Yeah. Make sense? That's what it means to be a divisor. It divides it. And it's a common divisor if it divides both of them. Pretty straightforward. Awesome. D is the greatest common divisor if for any other common divisor E, D is less than or equal to D. If D is the biggest possible divisor you get, it's called the greatest common divisor. Makes perfect sense, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be D is just less than B? Because you said any other. Any other common divisor E, then E has to be less than or equal to D. Why, why equal? Because it's any other. Uh, <laughs> it's, still true, it's still true for any other, but it's also true for any. Okay. Anyways, now we have this notation. We're going to have GCD, greatest common divisor, and we're going to plug two numbers in there. It's going to be our greatest common divisor function. Is that yeah. notation, GCD? Yes. GCD, parenthesis, put two numbers, and parenthesis. This is a shorthand for the greatest common divisor of A and B. So you're going to see me say D is the GCD of these two numbers. Okay. Now we're going to calculate the greatest common divisors of numbers. So you did something in your head pretty easily. What if I said, now I want you to find the greatest common divisor of 618 and 105. How do you figure out what the greatest common divisor is? Yeah, you kind of just try numbers, right? Yep. And then if I did something crazy for you, it's definitely not 100. No, it's definitely not. 100 is not even a divisor of 105. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. And if I gave you much bigger numbers, like 2, 1, 8, 6, 9, 7, and 3, 4, 9, 1, 2, I don't know, 9, how would you find the GCD between those two numbers? You'd probably put it in that way. You'd now have to try a ton of numbers yeah. to find the GCD between those two things. So we're going to come up now with a formula an algorithm, it's called Euclid's algorithm, for solving, for finding the greatest common divisor. Now, I hate having to memorize, but one of the things you're going to have to memorize is an algorithm. So Euclid's algorithm, we're going to use that to compute the greatest common divisor of two numbers, and you're going to use this algorithm over and over and over again. So you've got to get competent using this algorithm. Okay? Now, before we get to the algorithm, uh, we're going to prove something that the algorithm is going to use over and over again. And then, so when we use it in the algorithm, you're comfortable with it. So, what are we going to prove? We're going to prove that if A and B are in the positive integers, not sure why I put a star there, 
if a and b are positive integers and c is equal to a mod b, then the greatest common divisor of a and b is the same thing as the greatest common divisor of b and c. Let's do a really small concrete example really quick, just ones where we can easily see it with the numbers. Talking about 28 and 21, what's the greatest common divisor of 28 and 21? Seven. Seven. What we're proving is that the greatest common divisor of 28 and 21 is the same thing as the greatest common divisor of 21 and the remainder when you divide 28 by 21. What's the remainder when you divide 28 by 21? Seven. Seven. And so finding the greatest common divisor of 28 and 21 is the same as finding the greatest common divisor of 21 and 7. Okay. And if we can't do it for 21 and 7, we can do the same thing again. Take 21, modify 7. We got two new numbers and look for the GCD with those smaller numbers. It helps you take big numbers and reduce it to smaller numbers to, that you can talk about. Where did you get that 7? Huh? Where did you get the 7 you down? This 7? Yeah. This 7 is, 7 is equal to 28 mod 21. The remainder. So that's what our theorem is saying. Oh, yeah. Our theorem is saying if C is equal to A mod B, then the greatest common divisor of A and B is the same thing as the greatest common divisor of B and C, where C is A mod B. A mod B is C. The greatest common divisor of A and B is equal to the greatest common divisor of B and C, where C is A mod B. And if we start out with even bigger numbers, we could keep reducing it this way to get smaller and smaller numbers until we could work with it. Which is exactly what we're going to do. So before we prove the theorem, let's use it really quick. See an example of it. I say I want you to find the greatest common divisor of 289 and 300, and I'm not even sure what I just said. Restart. I want you to find the greatest common divisor of 689 and 234. Now that's kind of annoying. Those are big numbers. I don't want to have to think about those numbers. So I'm going to really quick calculate the mod. So 689 is equal to 2 234s plus 221. Okay. Here's the quotient, 2. Here's the remainder, 2 or 21. So the greatest common divisor of 629 and 234 is the same thing as the greatest common divisor of 234 and 221. So now I'm looking for the GCD of 234 and 221, right? Yeah. Well, I still don't want to work with numbers that big. So I need to figure out 234 mod 221. So let's do that. 234 is equal to 1 221 with a remainder of 13. So now this is the same thing as finding the GCD of 221 and 13. Right? Okay. Well, I still don't want to work with that for whatever reason. And so, once again, I may find the mod. When I take 221 and divide by 13, I may find the remainder. So 221 is 7 13s plus 0. So the GCD of 221 and 13 is the same as the GCD of 13 and 0. Okay. Now, anyone can calculate that. It's 13. The GCD of any number and zero is just that number. Because everything is a divisor of zero. I can always take any integer you give me, I can always multiply it by another integer to get zero. Namely zero. How do I know that 13 divides zero? Because I can find some integer such that 13 times that integer equals zero. Namely zero. So once you got down to the GCD of a number and zero, it's easy. It's always just that number. So that's using Euclid right here. That's Euclid's algorithm for finding the greatest common divisor. Start with your two numbers, 689, 234, and find the remainder, 221. Now take your divisor and your remainder and do it again, and you get a new divisor and remainder. Take it do it again, and you get a new divisor and remainder. Once your remainder is zero, you've got your answer. And it will always go down to zero, right? Yes, it will always ultimately reduce to zero. Okay, so let's have you guys do a concrete example now here.
uh, these two numbers. So we're going to find the GCD of 618 and 105. Okay. Right? So first thing I'm going to do is use our theorem. 618 is equal to how many 105s? Five. Five? Yeah. Five of them. So it's equal to five 105s with the remainder of Stop being so lazy. What's 105 times 5? 525. 525. Yep. Okay, so 618 minus 525. How much is 18 away from 25? 7. 7. So just subtract 7 from 100. 93. 93. That's what I said. Well, I didn't know if people were spewing out answers from just looking at their calculator if they thought about it. Sure wasn't. Sure wasn't. All right. So, plus 93. Now next. Because we don't want to have to work with those two numbers. So we repeat the process. Bring them over here, do it again. 105 is equal to how many 93s plus what? One. one. So it's equal to 193 plus? 15, 13, 17. 17. Maybe using the calculator is helping a lot. <laughs> Maybe 12. Just 12. Oh my goodness. <laughs> You guys' this crutch on calculators is showing. You can't do basic arithmetic. All right. And now 93 and 12 still don't want to work with that, so I'll bring those numbers down. 93 is equal to how many 12s plus what? Seven. Seven? Seven. Seven? 84. So 7 is 84 with a remainder of? Nine. Nine. Oh, goodness. Yeah, nine. Okay. Now those two numbers. 12 is equal to how many nines plus what? One nine plus three. One nine plus three. Okay, so now we do those two numbers. Nine is equal to how many threes plus what? Three zero. Three zero. Three zero. Oh, we got our zero. So three is the answer. Three is the greatest common divisor. Three is the greatest common divisor of those two numbers. Smallest number that, or it's the biggest number that goes into both of those evenly. Yeah. Right? What if you had one prime number? One of those were a prime number. Would it always be just one? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it would always be just one. What if it's like a decimal? Nope. They always have to be positive integers. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So that's an example of some of these. Now you might think, okay. Big whoop. <laughs> right? You can find the GCD of these numbers. Why not just manually calculate it? Now, if you go to your calculator and you try and plug in a really massive number, your calculator can't handle it. It's too massive. It's too massive. So, there's one reason. It helps you really quick cut down numbers that you can plug into your calculator so that you don't get rounding errors. That's one way to think about it. But also it's amazing that we're able to find the GCD of such big numbers in so few steps. Because what would be the other way that we actually tried this? Trying every number? Just brute forcing it, right? Okay. Trying all the numbers up to the smaller of the two numbers. Mm -hmm. Imagine, for a second, I gave you two numbers of the size roughly 10 to the 1,000. Now it's hard for you to appreciate how big that number is. 10 to the 1,000. What even is that? 10 to the 80 is roughly how many atoms there are in the observable universe. Oh, whoa, no. Lots. 10 to the 80 is roughly how many atoms there are in the observable universe. Oh, man. That's massive. <laughs> Where am I getting my 10? 80. 10 to the 80. 80. 10 to the 80. Imagine for a second. You took the whole observable universe, and then you doubled it, and then you doubled it again, and then you took that and you doubled it. You still haven't gotten to ten to the two hundred and eighty or to the eighty-one. You've got to increase it by a factor of ten to increase that exponent there. So 
So we take the observable universe, we make it 10 times bigger. Okay, now we're talking about that. We now take that universe, which we just made 10 times bigger, and we make it a billion times bigger. Okay, you just got to 10 to the 90. A billion? Why not 100? Oh, because you're adding 90. <laughs> you got 90. To get to 10 to the 1,000 is just stupid. <laughs> it's such a massive number. It is so hard to comprehend numbers this massive. So, absurdly massive number. Imagine I gave you two numbers like that to work with. Now, if we wrote some algorithm that brute force trying to figure this out, it could live throughout the entire age of the universe and it would never be able to solve this problem. Just brute force trying all the numbers. Okay. That makes sense. A super powerful supercomputer trying this just brute force. No, it's never going to find it that way. Using Euclid's algorithm, it has to go through roughly 7,000 steps. <laughs> So we're talking about numbers with so many digits. <laughs> Just absurdly <laughs> massive numbers. Hard to comprehend how big these numbers are. And we can do it in 7,000 measly steps. <laughs> I know 7,000 sounds like a lot, but 7,000 of these. We can easy manually crunch through a couple hundred of them each class. You and me just being dumb about it, we can solve this problem in a year. And with the other algorithm, your fanciest supercomputer couldn't solve it in the lifetime of the universe. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right. So now let's prove the crux of what we used here. Let's prove that if a and b are positive integers and c is equal to a mod b, c is a remainder when we take a and divide it by b, then the GCD of a and b is equal to the GCD of b and c. Okay. Yep. All right. So let B, let A and B be positive integers, and let C equal A mod B. And observe that there must exist some Q such that A is equal to Q times B plus C. C is the remainder. Q is the quotient. When you take A and divide by B, you get Q with the remainder of C, where C is between zero and B. C is the remainder. Good so far. All right, now let D equal the GCD of A and B, and let E equal the GCD of B and C. And it remains to show that D and E are the same number. D is the GCD of A and B, E is the GCD of B and C. If D is equal to E, then they're the same number. Or in other words, the GCD of A and B is equal to the GCD of B and C, which is what we're trying to show, right? The way I'm going to prove that is I'm going to prove that D is less than or equal to E, and E is less than or equal to D. Therefore, they're equal to each other. Okay. If I can prove that Chandler is shorter or the same tall as Jeremy, and Jeremy is shorter or the same tall as Chandler, then they're the same height. Okay. Your wishes. <laughs> okay. So that's going to be our logic here. So observe that D divides A and D divides B. It's a common divisor of A and B. It's their greatest common divisor. So D divides A and D divides B. Right? Yep. Now what does it mean for D to divide A? That means that there must exist some integer K1 such that A is equal to K1 times D. And what does it mean for D to divide B? It means that there must exist some integer K2 such that uh, K2 times D is equal to B. Okay. Okay. So now let's go back and look at C. Then C is equal to A minus Q times B. That's coming from, where did we write our equation? How am I not seeing this? I must keep looking past it. Observe that. Right there. Right here. Jeez. It's on one. I didn't think I did it that early. Looking at this equation. I know A is equal to QB plus C, so that means C is equal to A minus QB. I just put the QB over there. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So C is equal to A minus QB. But now we just barely found A in terms of D, and we just barely found B in terms of D. So we're just going to substitute that in. K1 times D for A, K2 times D for B. So C is equal to A minus Q times B, or in other words, is equal to K1 times D minus Q times K2 times D. Okay. Factor the D out. C is equal to D times some integer. 
Which integer? Who cares? The point is, we now know d divides c. So I just barely showed d divides c. So I now know that d divides c. So now I know that d divides b and d divides c. So d is a common divisor of b and c. Wrong way there. Therefore, d is less than or equal to e. e is the greatest common divisor of b and c. d is a common divisor of b and c. Therefore, d is less than or equal to e. Okay. That makes sense. Cool. Now we're going to do the exact same thing. I'm basically going to prove that e is a common divisor of a and b, and therefore e is less than or equal to d, and therefore they're equal to each other. I'm going to screw up my order on this. All right. So now we know that e divides b and e divides c. E is the greatest common divisor of b and c, so it's definitely a divisor of b and c. Which means that there must exist integers m1 and m2 such that b is equal to m1 times e and c is equal to m2 times e. Okay? So then, a is equal to q times b plus c using this. a is equal to q times b plus c. And we're just going to substitute in to the b and the c. So a is equal to q times b plus c. Substituting out the b, b is m1 times e. So we get q times m1 times e plus... Substituting out the C, we get M2 times E. Factor the E out of both of them. Or in other words, A is equal to E times some integer. So E divides A. So now I know E divides A, and I know E divides B. So E is a common divisor of A and B. But D is the greatest common divisor of A and B. So E has to be less than or equal to D. So I had D's less than or equal to E. I have E's less than or equal to D. Put those two facts together, and we get D's equal to E. Make sense? That's it. Okay. Now we're going to get to the second most important theorem in number theory. The second most important theorem in number theory. And that is this theorem right here. If A and B are integers, not both zero, then the smallest positive integer, AX plus BY, you can come up with, is going to be the GCD of A and B. This one seems way out of left field. Really weird theorem. Really weird thing that we would ever care about. Turns out it's absurdly useful. So we're going to try and wrap our heads around this. Pick A and B to be any integers you want. Okay. Then A times X plus B times Y, plug in X's and Y's for those. And you're always going to get an integer. The smallest positive integer you can get, plugging in x's and y's, is going to be the GCD of a and b. Let's do a really concrete example. So we're looking at ax plus by, okay. where a is 30 and b is 24. Okay. So our, the equation we're looking at is we have 30x plus 24y. I'm going to plug in x's and y's, and I'm going to get answers out of here, right? If I plug in 1 and 1, I'm going to get 54. Mm -hmm. If I plug in 1 and negative 1, I'm going to get 6. So I'm going to plug in a bunch of integers into this thing. The answer, the x and y that give the smallest positive integer I can get to come out of here, it turns out is going to be the greatest common divisor of 30 and 24. Let's write this out on table just to make sure we're all for sure clear. Here's a table. This right here are my x's. This right here are my y's. Okay. So if I plug in 0 for x, 0 for y, what do I get? 0. zero. zero. Right? Yep. What about if I plug in 1 for x and 0 for y, what do I get? 2 for x, 0 for y, what do I get? Or I could have plugged in negative 3 for x, 0 for y, what do I get? Negative 90. Negative 90. Right? I could have plugged in negative 3 for x, negative 3 for y, what do I get? 
negative 162. I could have plugged in positive 3 for x, positive 3 for y. What do I get? 162. Positive 162. Okay, imagine we filled out this table to infinity. Every possible x and y. Okay. And now we search on this table for the smallest positive integer we can find. 30. 30. That's the smallest positive integer we can find, right? No, 6. Oh, 6 is smaller. Can you find anything smaller than 6? No. 2. Negative Zero. Oh Any God. smaller positive integer. Is zero positive? Zero is not positive, zero is not negative. Zero's always been Oh, uh, no, even. So six is a six. Six. So, six is the smallest number we can get to come out of here. So, six is the greatest common divisor of 30 and 24. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Because 24 times six. What? So, we have to drop a graph every time? No, you will never drop a graph like this again. I just wanted to really make it concrete what the serum is saying. These are all the possible solutions to this equation. The solution that gives the smallest positive solution we can get out of it is always going to be the GCD. That is a really random thing. It seems like a super random theorem. How is that ever useful? Who cares? It turns out it's a very useful theorem. And the intuition as to why it is, you're just not going to get it. So I can't tell you why this is useful. You just have to take my word for it that it is useful, and then we'll use it a lot. Okay, okay so you understand what the theorem's saying? See. Let's attempt to prove it now. So let A and B be integers that are not both zero. Or, sorry, if A and B are integers not both zero, then the smallest positive integer we can get of the form AX plus BY is going to be the greatest common divisor of A and B. That's what we're going to prove. I know, seems right. All right, so now let A and B be any two integers where such that A is not equal to zero or B is not equal to zero. At least one of them is not zero. And now let D be all the numbers we can possibly write of the form AX plus BY, where X and Y are any two integers, and AX plus BY is greater than zero. So D is going to be the set of all the numbers on this table where we get rid of all the ones that aren't positive. Yeah, that's true. So we're getting rid of that number. We're getting rid of those. 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 We're getting rid of you. We're getting rid of you. You, 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 you. And we're getting rid of zero. So now all we have are these numbers. If we did this for the numbers 30 for A, 24 for B. All these numbers are what's going to be in D. Can't really see that, can you? So we're basically only keeping the numbers under the blue line. D is going to be a set of all those numbers. Okay. That's a whole set. Too. Yeah, D is a set. D is a set of all the solutions AX plus BY you get for any two integers X and Y, as long as the solution is greater than zero. So in other words, we're saying D is all, are all the numbers, all the positive integers that satisfy the equation. Now it turns out that the smallest thing in D, in our case 6, is going to be the greatest common divisor of A and B. We're going to show that. So that's how we're going to get our greatest common divisor, is now it's going to be the smallest element in D. Right? So that's what we're going to do now. So let D be all those integers, and observe that... Where is my white piece of chalk on? There it is. And observe that D is a subset of the natural numbers. Everything in D is going to be a natural number. You with me? D is a subset of the natural numbers. Now, we need to argue that D is not empty. How do I know that there's any solutions to the sink that are positive? If I have some random equation, AX plus BY, how do I know that there's any two numbers X and Y I can plug into seeing that make a positive. Because that's logic. Well, we just need to come up with one example. I just want to make sure that there's at least one thing in there. Okay. Well, one, one set of numbers we could pick is X to be A and Y to be B. Yeah. Because if X is A and Y is B, then this is the same thing as A squared plus B squared. What is a squared? It's always a positive number, or zero. What's b squared? It's always a positive number, or zero. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Since I know that at least one of A or B has to not be zero, they can't both be zero, at least one of these is a positive number. So A squared plus B squared is for sure greater than zero. And so it's going to be for sure in this set. In other words, finish writing this out, we for sure would have eventually written 30 times 30 plus 24 times 24, somewhere down here. So that's all we're going to say. Observe that A times A plus B times B is always greater than zero. Which gives me that A squared plus B squared is in D, which gives me that D is not empty. All that was just an argument for D is not empty. So now I know D is a subset of natural numbers, and D is not empty. So now what do I know? By the well-ordering principle, there is a least element. Wonderful! The well-ordering principle. Every non-empty subset of naturals contains a least element. So D is a subset of the naturals, D is not empty. Therefore, or then, by the well-ordering principle, D has a least element we'll call it little d. And it turns out that little d is going to be the greatest common divisor of a and b. We still need to prove that, but now we're able to get our hands on it. So there's little d. It remains to show that that little d is the greatest common divisor of a and b. So what do I need to show? I need to show that d is a common divisor of a and b, and then I need to show that it's the greatest common divisor of a and b. So first I need to show that d divides a and b. We're going to do this by way of contradiction. I'm going to assume that D does not divide A and B, and so that leads to contradiction, therefore D does divide A. Okay. All right, so to show that D divides A, I'm going to assume by way of contradiction that D does not divide A, gonna get a contradiction. So assume that D does not divide A. Well, we know then that there exist integers, unique integers Q and R, such that A is equal to Q, D plus R. I can take A and divide it by D. D is a positive number, so we're good. So far, I'm just saying, I'm going to show that it's impossible for D to not divide A. That's what I'm going to show. So far, what do I know? D is just some random positive integer. That's all I know about it. I know that I can take A and divide it by D. There's nothing wrong with that. So A is equal to Q times D plus R, where R is some number between 0 and D. I'm just taking A and dividing it by D. Now, I know that this remainder has to be greater than 0. It can't be equal to 0. How do I know that my remainder has to be greater than 0? I thought you said A cannot be divided by D. That's why it's by way of contradiction. To show that D divides A, I'm going to assume by way of contradiction that D doesn't divide A. Yeah. Right? A is not divisible by D. So A is not divisible by D. But if you show that it is. No. But it is not that greater than least. No. A equals, look. Let me give you an example really quick to the side over here. You can divide by a number that a number is not divisible by. That's perfectly fine. Does 3 divide 13? No. No. I can still take 13 and divide it by 3. 13 is equal to how many 3s? 4 3s plus 1. Mm -hmm. To say that 3 does not divide 13 means that when you divide it, there's going to be a remainder. Okay, that's what you mean. That's what I mean by it doesn't divide. Right? So when we say 3 does not divide 13, we mean when you divide by it, you get a remainder. Yeah. When we say 3 does divide 12, we mean when you divide by it, you don't get a remainder. Okay, so since D does not divide A, then when I take A and I divide it by B, I'm going to get a remainder. My remainder R is not going to be 0. It's going to be greater than 0. Okay. okay. So it's the fact that that R is going to be some number between 0 and D that's ultimately going to leave my contradiction. Okay. okay. Take this equation now and solve for R. R now is equal to A minus Q times D. Just took this and solved for R. Mm -hmm. Just move that to the other side. Yep. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what is D? D is... Ax plus By for some x and y, because d ultimately comes from the set. 
There's some x and y such that when I plug it in here, I get little d. Yep. So r is equal to a minus q times d. ax plus by for some x and y in z. We don't know what those x and y are. Okay. Okay. So then r is equal to a minus aqx minus bqy. Just expanding it out. Okay. Now group the two terms with the a's together. So it's equal to a times 1 minus qx plus b times negative qy. So now r is equal to a times some integer plus b times some integer. Okay, so that would mean that r is in d. Yeah. d is a set of all positive integers of the form a times some integer plus b times some integer. r is of the form a times some integer plus b times some integer, and r is for sure positive. It's greater than zero. Yeah. Sure. So r is in d. And r is less than d, contradiction, because d was the smallest element in big D. So if d doesn't divide a, then I could find a smaller integer in big D. But little d is the smallest thing in big D by definition. So it can't work. Okay. So if little d did not divide a, then we were able to find some integer called r in d that was less than little d. Impossible. D is the smallest thing in big D. Little d is the smallest thing in big D, right? Contradiction. Kind of a mouthful to prove that D does not divide, or to prove that D does divide A. The proof that D divides B is identical. So I'm not going to write that in here. It's basically the same thing. Switch out your A's for B's. So therefore, D divides A and D divides B. With me so far? So thus far, we have shown that D divides A and D divides B, or in other words, D is a common divisor of A and B. Now we just need to show it's the greatest common divisor of A and B. So now let E be any other common divisor of A and B. I need to show that E is less than or equal to D. Okay. So since E is another common divisor of A and B, we know that E divides A and E divides B. Which means E divides AX plus BY. Okay. E divides this number. Since E divides A, E divides A times X. That makes sense, yeah. Since E divides B, E divides B times Y. So E divides both the numbers in there. So E divides their sum. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's what we've proved a couple times. Okay. So this right here is D. So then E divides D. Since D is greater than zero, then all of its divisors are going to be less than or equal to it. It's true. So E is less than or equal to D since it's a divisor of D. Therefore, D is the greatest common divisor of A and B. You with me? Yeah. I know. It's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. It feels like you have to do a lot of weird things to get it. But it's very useful that AX plus BY is equal to the GCD. That there are solutions, X and Y, that make AX plus BY equal to the GCD of A and B. And we're actually going to have to solve equations like that over and over again. We are going to have to use Euclid's algorithm to find the x and y that satisfy this equation. We're now going to be interested in looking for x's and y's such that ax plus by gives us the GCD of a and b. All right. So that's something we're going to care about doing over and over again. Finding the GCD of a and b, and then finding the x and y such that when you plug it into this equation, it gives you the GCD of a and b. 
And it seems completely random, I know. Turns out to be very useful. When you like want to find the multiplicative inverse in modular arithmetic. I know. I can't tell you what we're going to use it for since you're not ready for that. <laughs> so I just have to tell you, we're going to use it, believe me. Okay. Uh, good enough. Got space there. Okay. So let's do an example. So we're given 689x plus 234y. We're trying to find the x and y that make this equal to the GCD of 689 and 234. Now we already found the GCD of 689 and 234. We found that that was 13. Okay. So in other words, I'm looking for the x and y that make this whole thing equal to 13. What are the x and y's I can plug into this equation such that it's equal to 13? You need to get a problem like that? Let me show you how to solve a problem like that. Okay. So first thing you do is on the left hand side you do Euclid's. So we start with 689 is equal to 2, 234 plus 221. Exactly what we did over there. Then we have this vertical line here. This is called extended Euclid's. On the other side of the vertical line, every time you do this, you rewrite this same equation except for this time solving for the remainder. So 689 is equal to 2 times 234 plus 221. We're solving for 221. We get that's equal to 689 minus 2 234. Okay. You with me? Yeah. That's the only difference between extended Euclid's and Euclid's is for each line here, make sure you do the other line over there. Okay. okay. Now continuing with Euclid's over here, same as normal. So we did for these two numbers. Now we want to do it for these two numbers. So for those two numbers, 234 is 1, 221 plus 13. Over here, solve for 13. Okay. Now, down here, again, we have 221 and 13. 221 is 7 13 plus 0. We don't bother solving for 0. You can if you want. Doesn't matter. Turns out it's not going to be useful. Okay. Now, what am I after? I'm after how many 689s and how many 234s do I need such that their sum is equal to 13. Yeah, so one's positive, one's negative. One's going to be positive, one's going to be negative. So I'm looking for 13 equals some number of 689s. I don't know, some number of 689s plus some number of 234s. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out the sum number that you put here and that you put here, right? Oh, so those are zeros. Oh, no, those aren't zeros. Some number. Those are just circles, right? So we start with this equation, 13, and it's equal to 200, it's equal to 1, 234, and negative 1, 221. So 13 is equal to 1, maybe put a 1 there just to make it very clear, 1, 234, and negative 1, 221, right? Yep. So this is how many 234s and 221s I would need to get 13. But I'm not looking for it in terms of 234s and 221s. I'm looking for it in terms of 234s and 689s. Right? So rather than writing it in terms of 234s and 221s, I may convert it to write it in terms of 234s and 689s. I may do a substitution on this 221. 221 is equal to 1, 689, minus 2, 214. So I'm going to do a substitution. Sorry, we're right here. For 221. So going from here to here, I substitute this 221 using this. You follow that? Now notice, what do we have? We have 234s and 689s. Now I just need to count up how many 234s and 689s we have. And that's how many 234s and 689s I need to get 13. Okay. So that's all we're doing. So I have, just take common factors. I have one 234 here, and then I have negative one times negative two gives me how many? Just two. Two, so I have one here and two here. How many do I have? Three, just. Three, I have three 234s. And how many 689s do I have? Uh, negative one. Negative one. 
So I have 3 234s and negative 1 689s. And to just write it in the same form as we have up there, that's 689 times negative 1 plus 234 times 3. In other words, negative 1 for x and 3 for y are the two numbers you plug in to get 13 out. That's it. We were looking for the x's and y's that made 13 come out. And this is. I thought we were looking for the least smallest positive integer. This is also the greatest common divisor of 689 and 234. Okay. That's a neat fact. Okay. okay. That's how we're going to be using this. I know. Seems weird. How is this ever going to be useful? Trust me. Is going to be useful. You gotta get comfortable with this algorithm. Start using it. Essentially, what's coming down the pipeline is we're gonna have a times x plus b times y equal to one, and we're gonna be very interested in the x and y's that make that thing equal to one. Okay. So you're gonna have to be able to solve those a lot. Right now we're doing 13 or whatever. This is more just for exercise to get comfortable with it. So now let's do it again. Here's the type of problem you're gonna get on your homework. It's going to say something like, find the GCD of 431 and 29, and then find the x and y that make this equation equal to that GCD. Okay. Oh, okay. That's going to be what your homework problem is. That's easy. So we got to find the GCD of 431 and 29, and then we got to find the x and y that make it equal to that. Mm -hmm. You with me? Mm -hmm. So we do Euclid's to find the GCD of 431 and 29. So what do we write? 431. 431 is equal to what? How many 29s? Sum the parentheses. <laughs> Some number of 29s plus well, okay. something. OK. How many 29s are we going to get in 431? 13. 13? Think he's right there? Well, we get roughly 3 per 100 with a remainder of 10, or with a remainder of 10. So going to 300, that's going to be 10 to 400, 11. Is it 12? It's 11. It's 11. So we don't quite get 12. OK, well, it's 11 times 229. Is it 12? It's not. What? It's not 12. It's way bigger than that. I was going 300. It's 400. Oh, I think I was too. It's 14. 14. That was close. All right. 14 times 200 times 29 is what? 422. 422? Is that right? No, no. six. You guys, is it faster for me to do this by hand? Maybe. 406. 406? 14 times 29 is 406. Is that really 14 right? times 29 is 406. Okay, so that's 406. And so what's our remainder going to be? 25. 25. Okay, here we go. So 431 is equal to 14 29 plus 25. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to rewrite it in terms of 29 and 25. Or, if you want to do this at the same time, we can come back and do it after the fact or do it at the same time, doesn't matter. But now solving for the remainder, 25 is equal to 431 minus 14, 29. Okay, next one. We have 29 is equal to how many 25s? Plus four, right? That is correct. Solve for the remainder over here. Four is equal to 29 minus, minus one, 25. Okay. Now, 25 is equal to six Why? times four. Why is there not four? <laughs> oh. Oh, I just put the parentheses in the wrong place is equal to six fours plus one, right? Yeah. 
Or in other words, the GCD for the remainder, 1, is equal to 25 minus 6 fours. With me? Mm -hmm. And so now, what's the greatest common divisor of 431 and 29? Let's get down to zero. One. Okay, let's get down to zero. <laughs> four is equal to four ones plus zero. It's four. Oops, I put the parentheses in the wrong place. It's four. It's one. It's what? Oh. Sorry. Right? Yeah. Okay. Which? We expect it because I picked two prime numbers. Oh, wow. Well, I don't know. I think it's prime. Or 29 is for sure. I think 431 is prime. But whatever it is, it's definitely not a multiple of 29. Okay. Okay. So there we have GCD. Now we want to find the X and Y such that when you plug them in, this whole thing evaluates to 1. Right? So I want to write 1 in terms of 431s and 29s. Now from here, I know 1 is equal to 25 minus 6 4s. Right? Yep. Now, I'm going to look up here and make the substitution on the line above. Substitute my 4s. So now I substitute all my 4s for 29s and 25s. So this is equal to 25 minus six fours, our fours are 29 minus one times 25. Now we're gonna collect like terms. One is equal to, let's see how many 25s we have. We have a 25 here, and we have negative six times minus one is gonna be positive six. So how many 25s do I have? Seven. I have seven 25s. Six, five, and then how many 29s do I have? Negative, and I have negative six 29s. Right? Yeah. Now I make the next substitution list out here. So I already substituted in for one. That's the equation I start with. Then I substitute out my fours. That was going from here to here. Now I substitute out my 25s. So instead of 25, I'm going to write this. So this is equal to seven 25s. 25 is 431 minus 14. 29s, and then I have minus 6 29s. Right? Yep. Now, that's equal to how many 431s do we have total? Seven. Seven. So that gives me seven 431s. And how many 29s do I have? Eight. I have seven times 14 here, Obviously. which is well, seven times negative 14. It's 98. 49 times 2. I don't know what you're doing. Oh, 70 plus 28. That works. Okay. <laughs> Still not sure how you would think about it. Okay. <laughs> Alright. So, now I forgot what we said. 98. So we have nine, negative 98 here. Minus 6 gives us 92. Negative 98 minus 6 is? Negative 92. Six. No. <laughs> that was 106. 106. Negative 106. 104. Negative 104. Minus <laughs> 104. Negative 8, not 6. 29s. 98. 98 and 6, but uh, negative. 98 plus 6 is 40. <laughs> Almost. Hundred off. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Anyways, there we go. There's our numbers. This is how many 431s and how many negative 104s you need to get 29. Er, said that wrong. <laughs> I'm saying yeah. This is how many 431s plus how many 29s you need to get 1. You'd have to take 7 431s and negative 104 29s. And then you'd get one. 
So that are the x and y that satisfy this equation, this equal to 1. That's what your homework problems are going to be like. This is what your test problems are going to be like. You will not be allowed a calculator on your test. Okay. I said, you will not be allowed a calculator on your test. <laughs> Why? Because you need to know how to do this algorithm. Okay. Sad. Okay. It's going to be crucial for modular arithmetic that you know how to do this algorithm. I guess I can make your whole test just like modular arithmetic. Well, so then you just have to use this algorithm anyways, and it just turns out this algorithm isn't your answer. You just have to do more work on top of it. Can't you just make us write out all of our work? Oh, you want a calculator just to check your work? Yeah, just like... I wouldn't care if it was just a handheld calculator. Yeah. I just don't want some phone or some graphing calculator that just spits out the GCD. I don't want you on the test to be fine calculating the GCD because you were able to plug that in, but have no clue how to do modular. Well, what's right there? We're yeah, that's what I'm saying. What if we write down all the oh. yeah, If you want to write down all your work so I can see the whole process, I guess I'd probably be okay. We'll talk about that later. Won't we'll worry about it now. For now, we'll say no. And then we'll see if I change my mind. Is the test in two weeks? No, I don't know. Next week. It depends on no, no, no. how much we drag our feet with this material. Oh, yeah, the <laughs> yeah, last test we dragged our feet. All right. Well. Next. Here's a definition now. If the greatest common divisor of two numbers is 1, then we call those two numbers relatively prime. Two numbers are relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is 1. Because one of them are prime. No, not necessarily. One of them can be. Yeah, I see. But you can look at 21 and 8. 8. 21 and 8. Their greatest common divisor is 1. These two numbers are relatively prime. Yeah. That's what we mean by relatively prime. Okay, corollary to the proof we did over here. There exists x and y such that ax plus by equals 1 if and only if a and b are relatively prime. Well, yeah, you just said it. Yeah, basically. Just making, just making this very explicit. If I can find ax plus by equal to 1, if I can find an x and y that make that true, then a and b have to be relatively prime. Similarly, if I know that a and b are relatively prime, there has to be an x and y that makes this equation true equal to 1. Okay. And that's going to be the back and forth substitution that we do a lot. It's going to be really awkward when you need to add in your proof. You know a and b are relatively prime, then we're going to jump to, okay, so now we know that ax plus by equals 1. And that's going to be an awkward jump that we make over and over again. But that's how it's going to be really useful. Okay. Next. Proof. Let D be the greatest common divisor of A and B. We're going to prove that if E divides A and E divides B, then E divides D. Let's make sure that this makes sense. D is the greatest common divisor of A and B. Yes. Therefore, anything that divides A and B will also divide their greatest common divisor. Okay. In other words, everything that divides A and B is going to be a factor of its greatest common divisor. So if you can find the greatest common divisor of it, then you can factor that thing, and that will give you all the factors. Okay. So going back to 21 and 28... What was its greatest common divisor? Seven. seven. So now all the divisors of 21 and 28, all its common divisors, are going to be factors of seven. One seven. The only factors of seven that are positive are one and seven. So one and seven are the only positive numbers that divide both these things. Okay. That's what we're saying. True. So let's prove it. So let B be the GCD of A and B. Well, what does that mean? That means that there must exist some x and y such that d is equal to ax plus by. That's from our previous theorem, second most important theorem in number theory. There has to be an x and y such that ax plus by equals d if d is the GCD of a and b. Right? Yes. Okay. Then, if d divides a and d divides b, d obviously divides d. d is equal to some number of a's plus some number of b's. If the number divides a and b, it's going to divide this sum. 
Make sense? Straightforward proof? Okay. That gets us to the end of GCD. Next section is on modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic. Now you know what arithmetic is. What's arithmetic? Algebra. Math. Not even all of algebra. You only study arithmetic in grade school. Very simple math. It's just Operations. addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's it. That's what arithmetic is. So we're adding addition. And so yeah, we're gonna go back to doing plus, times, subtraction, and divide. Sweet. You're not gonna have to do this on the real numbers. You're not gonna have to do it on the rationals. You're not even gonna have to use the integers or even the naturals. What? We're going to do arithmetic on very, very, very small sets. On like just limiting ourselves to a set like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those will be the only numbers we work with. And we're going to just do arithmetic with those. That's well, really, really easy. Cool. Can it yeah, get any easier? Uh, no. We're going to struggle a while here. We'll see how easy this can get. So first off, quick notation. Z sub n means the first n natural numbers. So we're going to do, be doing arithmetic on sets like this. So for example, if I see z sub 5, that's equal to the first five natural numbers, which is 0, 1, 2, yeah, 3, 4. Yeah, because yeah. now the z means n. No. Uh, why don't we use the notation n sub 5? Because some people are dumb and start the natural numbers with 1. So that's why not n. I agree, this would be better notation. We're not done, not like so Z we plus. should use the better notation. Z plus, yeah, right, right, it starts with one. So, so we'll just know that the book is done and we won't be done. So because this is common notation across several authors who use the natural numbers different, this is a notation used. I agree, it would be better if that were an N, but it's not the notation used. Okay. Here's a notation used. So Z sub five is a number zero, one, two, three, four. And then we're just going to be doing arithmetic on those numbers. Adding them together, multiplying them, stuff like that. Simple. So, let n be some positive integer, and let a and b be elements of z sub n. So in other words, n could be something like 4 or 5, then z, a and b would be elements in here. Okay? Okay. Now, we got a problem when we start doing arithmetic in here. Because if I'm going to limit myself to this set, and I want to do something like 3 plus 3, what's that going to be? 6. Seven. Not in that set. Not in that set. It, we run into a problem, right? And we want to keep it in that set. So I'm going to say that if we're going to define it, so that 3 plus 3 is, let's see, we get 0, 1, 2, 3. Now I need to add 3 to that. 1, 2, 3. Our arithmetic is going to say that this is equal to 1. Uh, uh -huh. 1. Nine. Our arithmetic. Wait, what's 2 plus 2? Two? 2 four. plus 2 is still going to be 4. <laughs> but now when we look at something like 4 times 4, what do you think 4 times 4 is going to be? 4. It's going to come out 1. It's going to be 1. Yeah. So we're going to get 4 4 times. So we got 1, 2, 3, starting 1, 2, 3, 4, add 4 again. 1, 2, 3, 4, add 4 again. 1, 2, 3, 4, add 4 again. 1, 2, 3, 4, and we end up at 1. No, there's smarter ways to do this. I'm just showing you what's going to be happening. So we're trying to keep ourselves within our set. Similarly, when we want to find subtraction, if I do 3 minus 2, that's obviously just going to be 1, right? Yep. But now if I did something like 2 minus 4, what's that going to be? 3. 3. It's going to go... Back one, back two, back three, back four. Okay? Right. It's kind of like doing time on a clock. Right? If you're at one o'clock and you subtract two hours, now you're back at 11 o'clock. So it's eight o'clock times by two. It's in a clock except for a more intelligent clock because we have a zero rather than using 12 weird. <laughs> right? Our clocks make no sense how we use 12s. Yeah. Like PM, AM, three. When is midnight? 12 AM. Why we have yeah, 60 seconds? That's the start of the day. Anyways, 
60 because it's a very divisible number. 60 is divisible by 1, it's divisible by 2, it's divisible by 3, it's divisible by 4, it's divisible by 5, it's four. divisible by 6. Yeah, 4 times 15 equals 60. So it's easy to do basic arithmetic with. That's why the Babylonians use 60. But we really like 10. Yeah, we switched to 10, but that was a switch that happened in history. And so a lot of our, our ways, the things that we kept track of prior to that switch... A lot of them are still base 60, like seconds and minutes, even our calendar. Our calendar was initially months were just 30 days, each of them, for a similar reason. A circle, it's broken up into 360 degrees. Where does that come from? 60 times 6. Same thing. So the reason the Babylonians did it is because it was a very divisible number and it caught on until base 10 systems caught on. And then some things just stuck around because that's what was used. Same reason we still use feet and inches and miles. What a bunch of nonsense. What would we use instead? Meters and kilometers and centimeters. Yeah, but those are all like dumb. How many centimeters in a meter? Ten. A hundred. <laughs> How many meters in a kilometer? A thousand. Okay. How many feet in a yard? Three. How many yards in a mile? You don't even know. You have to go back to feet and say there's 5,280 feet in a mile. Times it by three. <laughs> oh. How many inches in a foot? 12. Why 12? I, have a, I had a teacher. He was a Hungarian. And he came to America, I think, to get his PhD. And there was some test he had to take. And he got perfect scores on his test, except for where he had to convert units. Because mm -hmm. for the life of him, he could not remember how many feet were supposed to be in a mile. Because it's so random. Because <laughs> he grew up with just meters and centimeters, the metric system. So some things just hang around. 60 showing up everywhere. It's one of those things that just hang around. Any normal person would break a circle up into two pi radians. <laughs> Not into 360 degrees. Makes no sense. But it's caught up. Anyways, so that's what we're going to be doing. That kind of arithmetic. Now... What were we doing when we were going around in a circle? When we said z sub 5 was equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we kind of were counting around in a circle, that's exactly what modding by 5 would have done for us. So I asked you to figure out what 4 times 4 was. you remember what it was? Yeah, 1. It was 1. one. There's a much easier way that we could have counted that. 4 times 4 is, just regularly, 16. 16. Now mod by 5 because there's 5 elements in here. What's 16 mod 5? 1. 1. So it's going to be 1. Whoa. That's cool. Because when you mod by 5, you basically get rid of all the times you counted all the way through the set. Yeah. And so it tells you how much you counted through the set on your last count. So when we did 4 times 4, we kept counting through it, counting through it, counting through it. And we counted through it 3 times with the remainder of the 1 left. Similarly, what's 4 plus 4 going to be in this set? Well, eight. 4 plus 4 is 8, mod 5 is? 3. 3. Or you can write it out if you want, do 4 and then add 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Ah, oh, we got the 3. So, doing our special arithmetic on the set is just like doing normal arithmetic, and then you just mod your answer. So that's what our definition is going to be. Let n be some positive integer. And let A and B be members of Zn. So n's going to be how many elements are in the set? Something like 5 or 10 or whatever. And A and B are going to be two random things in the set. By definition now, here's how we're going to write our plus to help keep things straight in our head. A plus B, this is plus in our weird set here. A plus B is going to be equal to A plus B the way you know and love, and then just mod by n. Similarly, A times B is just going to be A times B the way you know and love, and then mod by n. Make sense? Cool. Let's do some examples. Let's pretend that n was equal to 10. Or in other words, z sub n is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 9. Okay. The first 10 natural numbers. Oh, now we're going to do arithmetic in this set. All right? Okay. Let's test you. Don't make me get some grade score to come watch you. What's 5 plus 5? 0. 0. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Because 5 plus 5 is 10, mod 10 is 0. That's right. Or in other words, if we listed all these out, once we got to 5, if we kept counting, 
six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Right? Yeah. Kind of like a clock going around in a circle. All right. What's five plus eight? Three. Four. Four. Yeah. Three. Why is it not four? What's five plus eight? Thirteen. Thirteen. Mod ten. Four. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm wondering if you're getting stuck thinking some weird way. Do we oh, call it stupid zero? Huh? Do we call it plus? Yeah, that's the only answer. Or is it yeah, the way it's to say it? You might say mod plus it's if you need to specify. Ten, but it only goes up to nine. But no, you can typically say plus if people will follow what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Alright. To nine. <laughs> What's two plus two? Two. Four. 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 Woo. Yes. What's nine plus nineteen? Hang on, give me a minute. 28 mod. So, 8? 10. 8? Yeah. The answer is not 8. It's and I will give extra credit to any student who can tell me why within the next 30 seconds. Wait, let me figure it out. 9 plus 19. That's a big number. 7. You can, not, you can skip the next test. 28. 28. 28. 28. <laughs> it's not 8. You, you can have a hundred on your next test. Okay, 19 plus 9 is 28. 28 mod 10. Oh, it's 9. It's, it's, it's 10. All right, time's up. No, it's, you're all wrong. It's 9. The answer is it's undefined. Why? You cannot apply this operation to things that are not members of the set. Vol. Let A and B oh, be I'm members so of the set. Then A plus B is A plus B mod N. That was so easy. Yeah, ask the question again. You could just <laughs> press now. Maybe I'll put it on the test. All right. I'm ask it one more. So that's undefined. That depressing. Let's keep going now. No one's ever gotten that question right. Still. <laughs> and I always give that deal. <laughs> or some deal. All right. What's five times five? Five. Five. What's five times eight? Zero. Zero. Everyone understand what we're doing? <laughs> What's two times two? Four. Four. What's nine times eight? Two. 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 Because it's seventy-two. No. Seventy-two. My pen is. Oh, he's right. <laughs> What's nine times nine? One. Three. I'm just kidding. <laughs> One. Nine times nine is eighty-one. <laughs> mod by ten. Gives us a remainder of one. Good. We need to do more of those, or you think you got it? We'll probably do more of them. Some homework. For sure, you'll get some. I'd homework. love to do more of those, but it's okay. They're kind of fun. Let's change our set. They are fun. Let's okay. do thirteen here. Oh yeah. yeah these are so not this fun. is goes nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and let's just rework all these answers. All right, what's five plus five? Ten. Ten. What's five plus eight? Whoa, that's not zero. True. Is it? It's ten. Thirteen. Five plus five is ten, mod ten is ten. Oh. Or mod thirteen is ten. Anything mod a bigger number is just that number. Okay. Five plus eight is what? Zero. 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 It's thirteen, but then we mod by thirteen gives us zero. Two plus two is? Four. Four. 9 plus 19 is? Undefined. Undefined. Good job. 5 times 5 is? 2. Come on. 12. Thank you. What? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. No, it's not nothing. It's 12. <laughs> 5 times 8 is? 40. No. What? 40. <laughs> it said uh, it's 1. 40. 1. Right? How are you guys doing I can't so even fast? Math that fast. <laughs> How many times? So 40, what's 40 divided by 13? Well, obviously, give me a minute. <laughs> Three. Three, which gets you up to 39. <laughs> so remainder one. Right, right, right. I didn't get to 39 because I unlocked 26. <laughs> <laughs> You're traveling by 13. <laughs> <laughs> what I did is do it a little faster. All right. <laughs> what's two times two? Four. 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 What's sure? nine times eight? 72. 30 
Nine times eight is? Four. 72. 72. Now, I don't know. We'll stick with his method. What did he do? He did 39 times two is? 78. Right? Yep. So we overcount it. So count down by 13 from 78. What do you get? 65. 65. Now 65 to 72 is? 7. seven. It's 7. Zang, 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 zang. <laughs> oh, it's... <laughs> it's going to be... You said 6, right? Yeah. No, that it's always going to be 13 minus what you want it to be. <laughs> no. If you count that way. Right. And 9 times 9 now is? Three. 6. It's 3. 78. Oh, it's 3. It's 3. Oh, it's not. It's 5. No, I'm just kidding. No. It's 6. 36 is three. 2. Someone's piggybacking on our previous work and the rest of you aren't. It's 6. Whoa. Jeremy, he's waiting for you. 72. 81. <laughs> 39 plus 39 is 78 plus 3. 81. That's three. That's three. Of us, and there's only one person not. <laughs> so, well, that's why she was coming up with it so quick. She yeah. started from 78. The rest of you were rethinking through the problem. Yeah, wow. Well, so, that's why I said one of you who's piggybacking on the previous work. I used to be so good at just the rhythm. Well, practice more. Stop using your calculator. 11 times 12, though. 132. No. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. No. <laughs> so, okay. 13 times 4. 1, hang on. 166. 156. Okay. Enough of that. See how small <laughs> Mine 12s, I used to be so quick. Okay. Well, I'm actually pretty quick. <laughs> Let's continue. Okay. Here are perfect. Yep. All right. If A and B are in Z sub N, where N some positive integer, what I'll just kind of assume that that's understood from here on out. Okay. Then A plus B is also in ZN, and A times B is also in ZN. This is going to be homework for you. You're going to have to prove this. Oops, okay. But should be pretty straightforward. What is A plus B? By definition, looking up here, that's a regular A plus B mod N. If I take a number and I mod it by n, what's the biggest I can possibly get? If I take a plus b and I mod it by n, what's the biggest number that could possibly come out of there? A b minus b. 1. B. n minus 1. So if we're modding by n. Oh, yeah, yeah. right. Right? right. right? Yep. In the problems here, what was the biggest my remainder could possibly be? 12. 12. Because n was 13. Right. So in general... A plus B mod N, the biggest it could possibly be is N, N minus 1. Mm -hmm. What's the smallest it can be? Zero. 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 So it always has to be a number between 0 and N minus 1. That's exactly what Z sub N is. It's all the numbers from 0 to N minus 1. Or is it the numbers in between 0 and N? No, we don't include N. Z sub 5 is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's the first five numbers. Right, but if it's like... Which ends up 4. Oh, well, never mind, I guess. So Z sub N is all the integers up to, but not including N. So our remainder is always going to be some integer from 0 to N minus 1. So A plus B mod N is definitely going to be in Z sub N. And A times B mod N is definitely going to be in Z sub N. Right. Make sense? Because it's going to be some number between 0 and n minus 1. Yes. Because we mod it by n. Okay. <clears throat> now, proof. If a, b, and c are in z sub n, where n is greater than or equal to 2, comma, then all this happens. Why do I need n to be greater than or equal to 2? Because I'm going to reference the number 0 and the number 1. And 0 and 1 are only in z sub n if n's at least 2. Make sense? <laughs> Let me make sense of this. What would z sub 1 be with our notation? 
it would be just a second hanging zero. What would z sub 2 be? The second hanging zero one. Now if I put any n here, bigger than 2, then my set for sure has 0 and 1 in it. Right? And if I'm going to do arithmetic with 0 and 1, I need to make sure that they're in the set. So that's why I say n has to be greater than or equal to 2. That's just making sure 0 and 1 are in the set. OK, so then we're going to have all these properties. Properties you know and love. The first property, what does that first property tell us? That they are commutative. The first property tells us a plus b is equal to b plus a. Or in other words, addition is commutative. And a times b is equal to b times a. Or in other words, multiplication is it's commutative. No. Yeah. Addition and multiplication are commutative. That's the first thing. We can prove that. We're not going to bother proving that one. Uh, pretty much the hardest of these to prove is associativity. So that's what we're going to prove. Associativity. a plus b plus c is equal to a plus b plus c. And similarly, a times b times c is equal to a times b times c. Or in other words, addition and multiplication are associative. And then a plus 0 is equal to a. Or in other words, 0 is the additive identity element. And a times 1 is always equal to a. Or in other words, 1 is the multiplicative identity element. Adding by 1 is the same thing as identity. It spits back out what you give it. Multiplying by 1 is the same thing as identity. It spits back out what you give it. Right? OK. And then finally, our distribution rule. a times b plus c is equal to a times b plus a times c. Good? Yep. All right. So we're going to prove associativity, one of these. We can prove all of these, but we'll just do one to get a feel for how these proofs go. I'm not sure if any are required in your homework. OK, so proof. Let n be a positive integer. Let's see, is this one where I have to use your homework problem? I do have to use your homework problem here. So. Maybe before we do this, let's uh, jump over and prove your homework problem really quick. Uh, jump over to the whiteboard. So homework problem that you got stuck on. You can see the top to the bottom of the whiteboard and okay, we won't go off the screen. Uh, let's get that one back in. Homework problem that you got stuck on was a proof that A is congruent to B mod N if and only if A mod N is equal to B mod N. Something like that, right? Okay? okay? So let's prove this direction first. Let's prove that this implies this. So, well, yeah, I won't bother saying let A and B be integers and N be a positive integer, blah, blah, blah. Assume we said that. So now let's do this direction. So assume A is congruent to B mod N. What does that give us? What do I know if A is congruent to B mod N? What's the definition of that? That N divides A minus B. Then N divides A minus B. They're different. It's perfect. What does that give me? It gives you that there exists such an integer, namely C, that N times C equals A minus B. Yeah, I'll call it K. Uh, make sure you, I don't go off the camera. That means that there exists k and z such that uh, n times k is equal to a minus b, right? OK. Uh, 
Okay. This one's kind of a weird one going this way. The other way is a little bit more intuitive, but we'll continue with it. Follow me on this one. Something that we haven't really done a lot of, but something that should make sense. That means that there exists two integers, q1, comma, and q2, such that it doesn't really mean it. I'll just say observe. We'll start a new line. Two. Observe that there exists two integers, q1, comma, and q2, such that k is equal to, I think I want to write as a difference, q1 minus q2. Where do you I don't know. And I'm just saying, look, you can express that k as a difference of two integers. Right. I know. It seems a little out of left field, but it works for where I'm going. So then that gives me that n times q1 minus q2 is equal to a minus b. Now, I'm going to put them so that a plus one of them is equal to b plus the other of them. Uh, let me see what I was thinking here. Okay. Well, just write that out one more time. This is equal to n times q1 minus n times q2 is equal to a minus b. That gives me this. Okay, now that gives me that. Uh, put this on the same side as a and this on the same side as that. So my b is coming over here and this term's coming over here. So b minus n times q2 is equal to a minus n times q1. Wouldn't that be a plus q2? Not one. Hmm. What am I even thinking here? It should be minus on both sides. But R equal to I am thinking weird here. I do not think that that is justified. what I'm doing. Erase that. Yeah, I can erase that. Yeah, way overthinking it. So two. Then A is equal to B plus NK. Right? This is going to be way easier. I have no clue what I was thinking there. It's what I get for just writing an answer rather than thinking. So this to this, super easy, right? Yep. Now I'm just going to mod in on both sides. So that gives me that A mod in is equal to B plus N times K mod in. You with me? Yeah. What is n times k mod n? n times k mod n. Yeah. Let me do some concrete examples because once you see it, it's obvious. What is 10 times 40 or 10 times 4 mod 10? 4. Zero. How many times does 10 go into 10 times 4? 4. four. Four times with a remainder of what? Zero. zero. Okay, you got me there. What if I put nine here? Okay. Now what's the mod? Oh, it's still zero. It's still zero? Okay, what if I put a negative nine here? Zero. 
Oh, it's still zero? No, it's negative 90. 10 goes into 10 times negative 90, exactly negative 90 times, with no remainder. <laughs> right? Yes. Did you see it? We good? Yeah. Or in other words, 10 times x mod 10 is always zero. zero. Or in other words, oh, oh. n times x mod n is always equal to or x zero. Mod zero. I mean zero yeah. <laughs> right? This is equal to zero. So I have n times k and I mod it by n. Zero. That's zero. Whoa, there's no x, that's a k. Holy cow. <laughs> so b plus n times k mod n is the same thing as just b mod n. This all comes out to zero. So this is equal to b mod n. Oops, I was writing it. b mod n. And so we got a mod n is equal to b mod n. And that's finished? Yeah, that's finished. Well, I told you. I saw a way better way to do it. I don't know what I did in that homework problem. That's what I get for using my answers as a student instead of my answers as a teacher. So now we have to go. So now we need to go the other way. Oh. All right, the other way. Won't even bother looking at what I did before. Okay, three. This time I want to show that this implies this. So now we assume a mod n is equal to b mod n, right? Yeah. And I know that there must exist q1 comma Q2 comma R such that A is equal to Q1 times N plus R and B is equal to Q2 times N plus R. Right? How do I know that the remainder for this is the same as the remainder for this? How I have a Q1 and a Q2 here. How come I don't have an R1 and an R2 here? Because A and B are Because A mod N is equal to B mod N. What is A mod N? It's a remainder. What's B mod N? It's a remainder. So they have the same remainder. That means when you express them this way, their quotients could be different, but their remainder has to be the same. Or in other words, well, we just leave it like that. What am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that if this is equal to this, then this is congruent to this. I'm trying to show this implies this, right? Yes. What does it mean for A to be congruent to B mod N? Then N, N, N It means N divides our difference. A minus B. So let's calculate their difference and see if N divides it. Pretty straightforward. So for then A minus B, what's that equal to? A which is Q1 times N plus R minus B, which is minus Q2 times N minus R, right? Mm -hmm. Plus R. Minus R. Oh, yeah. We're subtracting it. Jeez. I have to write the when I'm on my knees. <laughs> okay. Right? That's what A minus B is? Yeah. Now notice the R's go out. So this is equal to just these two terms. I'm going to factor out the n. It's equal to n times q1 minus q2. Yep. What does that mean? A minus b equals n minus q2. The n Perfect. That means that n divides a minus b. What does that mean? A, a, mod square a is congruent to b mod n. Not therefore square rocks. That doesn't really make sense. Therefore, A is congruent to B mod N square box. Mm -hmm. Good? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, not that bad. Kind of a tough homework problem for you guys. Really? Kind of. All right. Let's go back now and use that in a proof. Let's see, maybe.
maybe I can get. I'll just readjust before we get to that. <laughs> oh, that's not anything we're covering. We're just this. That was other homework. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a good point. Alright. <clears throat> so now let's do this proof. Let n be some positive integer, let a and b and z in. We're going to prove that our addition is associative. We're going to prove that a plus b plus c is equal to a plus b plus c. You with me? Okay. Okay. It, it's a lot, but I'm going to over explain something the first time and then we'll never have to over explain it again. My over explaining is going to be that we can always express a plus b as a plus b plus some multiple of n. That's going to be my over explanation once, and then from here on out, anytime we see that, we can think about is that if we want. Okay. So we'll over explain that. So observe that b plus c by definition is b plus c mod n, right? Yeah. Okay. So we're talking about b plus c mod n. Uh, notice that there exists unique integers q and r such that b plus c is equal to q times n plus r. I'm dividing b plus c, I'm dividing it by n. And its remainder is what this is equal to. b plus c, b modular plus c, is equal to the remainder of b plus c when we divide by n. That's how we've been calculating these things, right? Yep. So, when we take b plus c and we divide it by n, we get some quotient and some remainder. That remainder, then, we solve for that remainder, r. r is going to be equal to b plus c minus q times n. Okay. So, r is equal to b plus c plus some integer times n. In this case, negative q. That's what r is equal to. Remember, r is the same thing as what b plus c is equal to. When we were doing this arithmetic in our heads, when I said really quick, what's 5 times 8? Sorry, we were doing a plus. When I said what's 5 plus 8, you were adding it together, then calculating the remainder. So when we're doing this arithmetic, we're always looking for remainders. So b plus c is this r. That r is what we're looking for with b plus c. That r is also equal to our regular b plus c, Minus q times n. So what do we mean? I mean that b plus c mod n, or this whole expression, is equal to b plus c plus some integer times n. Call that new integer k. I guess I have k sub 1 right there. So it's equal to b plus c plus some integer times n. So any times you have a plus b in arithmetic, there always has to exist some integer k such that that's equal to a plus b plus k times n. Maybe zero, maybe not. Does that make sense? Because this is always giving us a remainder. When we take a plus b and we divide it by n, the remainder is always just going to be a plus b minus qn. Negative q is just, is just an integer. OK, so that's the important piece. What did we ultimately show? You can take b plus c, and you can rewrite it as b plus c plus some integer times n. So now let's plug that in. So then a plus b plus c is the same thing as a plus b plus c mod n mod n. Just using our definition. What's b plus c using our definition? It's b plus c mod n. What's a plus that using our definition? It's a plus that mod n. Right? In the first a, b plus c mod n, we calculate that up there. That's exactly b plus c plus some constant times n. Now we're doing a plus that. For the exact same reason, that's going to be a plus b plus c plus this constant times n plus some other constant times n. We put our n's together, and now it's going to be a plus b plus c plus the sum of two constants is still just a constant times n. Call k1 plus k2 just regular k. So when that's all said and done, what did we show? We showed that a plus b plus c using this addition is exactly just a plus b plus c using our regular addition, all modded by n. Yeah. Perfect. 
Now we can do the exact same thing to show that this is just a plus c, b plus c, all modded by n. So this is equal to that. This is equal to that. They both equal that. Therefore, those are equal. There's a lot more words. Oh, sorry. Not equal. <sighs> sorry. Let me finish my thinking here so I don't screw it up. So a plus b plus c is equal plus some constant times n is equal to a plus b plus c plus some constant times n. Okay, so now let's look at that mod n. a plus b plus c plus kn is congruent to a plus, c plus, a plus b plus c mod n, because this would just be a zero, right? That's what I meant to say. This is congruent to this mod n because that counts for zero. And then similarly, when we expanded this thing out, we'd get that it's also congruent to a plus b plus c mod n. So I get that this thing is congruent to this, is congruent to where we started this. So we get that this is congruent. Sorry, we're down here. Using our theorem that we proved over there, we get this is congruent to this, mod n. Oh, I have it right here. <laughs> too many equals and too many congruent signs. I keep messing it up. Let's get very clear. Put my finger so I don't lose what line I'm on. Okay. Here we got all the way down to a mod plus b mod plus c. This whole thing is equal to a plus b plus c plus some constant times n. Okay, that's what it's equal to. Now, taking that, which is taking that, that is congruent to just a plus b plus c mod n, because this counts for zero. Okay, so this is now congruent to that. This is the same thing as that, so now we got this is congruent to that. Similarly, we would show that this is congruent to that. It's the exact same thinking. You just expand it out a little bit different. So this is congruent to that. This is congruent to that. So we get that this is congruent to this, mod n. What did we prove over here? We proved that if a is congruent to b mod n, then a mod n is equal to b mod n. So that gives us that a plus b plus c mod n is equal to a plus b plus c mod n when you change the parentheses. So we prove that a congruent to b mod n means a mod n is equal to b mod n. So that means that this thing, mod n, is equal to this thing, mod n. That's what we wanted. Good? Anything weird? Okay, it's, the heart of it is just using the serum right here. Going from the congruence to splitting it up. So we get, they're both congruent to the same thing, therefore that's congruent to each other, therefore they're equal to each other mod n. Which they're already modded n, so that doesn't change anything. Okay, that's that. Now we wanted to find subtraction. A minus b. So you'll notice, even going back to grade school, Using addition and multiplication, that was nice and easy. You started out with just the counting numbers with kids. One, two, three, four. And kids could add and multiply those numbers together. That wasn't very hard. Then comes the idea of subtraction. Subtraction is a little bit harder for kids. They can do something like 6 minus 2. They're fine with that. But what about 2 minus 6? That's kind of weird. If you have two cupcakes and I take away 6, you have negative 4 cupcakes. What does that even mean? Right? How do you show a kid at negative 2? I know 2. What's negative 2? Negatives, not as intuitive as we like to pretend they are. We kind of ignore how they confuse us. Like how a negative times a negative is a positive. How does that make any sense? If you have negative three groups of negative four apples, you have 12 apples. 
<laughs> so we've gotten used to negatives, but we kind of avoid thinking about negatives too much. I don't like zero. I don't know about that. Zero is a lot easier for us to reason about. No. I understand zero apples. Negative two apples. Well, I mean like dividing by zero and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So now we need to come up with the notion of subtraction, or the notion of a negative number in our arithmetic. So we define a minus b to be the unique. This is going back to regular arithmetic. How do I know what a minus b is? And we want to define it in terms of addition. And so if you were taking some rigorous arithmetic class, they say a minus b is the solution to the equation a plus what? or b plus what equals a, right? What's a minus b? That's the same as asking b plus what equals a, oh, right. right? That's how you might explain to a kid, what do you mean by a minus b? If you're trying to tell them what 6 minus 4 is, you're saying, what do you have to add to 4 to get 6? Something like that, right? be a little bit easier. Well, how we kind of explain subtraction. So a minus b, what is that? If that's equal to x, when is a minus b equal to x? When x is a unique solution to this equation, where x is a number such that when you add it to b, you get a. So we're defining subtraction in terms of addition. So you start by knowing what addition and multiplication are, and then you can use addition to define subtraction, and you can use multiplication to define division. So we're defining subtraction. We're going to do a similar thing for our own way of defining subtraction now. So here's what we're going to do. If a and b are in zn, we're going to show that there exists a unique x in zn such that a is equal to that x plus b. And then that x is what we are going to mean later when we say a minus b. What's a minus b? It is going to be the one and only x that answers this question. Does that make sense? If two x's answer the question, then it doesn't make sense to talk about a minus b. a minus b, we don't want it to be two numbers. Or four numbers. We want there to be one and only one number that answers the question. What's a minus b? Right? Losing you guys too much for one day? A little bit. All right. We can restart there with uh, next week jumping into subtraction and defining negative numbers. Maybe just talk a little bit about arithmetic in general. Well, not worry about coming back to this for a second. But even back to arithmetic, when you're asked to do something, what's, what's the best way to say this? When you define a negative number, what is a negative number? What is negative 3? It's uh, yes. 0 minus 3. Let's go back and set up just some rudimentary foundations. You'll kind of have to take my word for it. In the beginning, the axioms of arithmetic only give us two numbers. They give us the numbers 1 and 0. 1 and 0. That's all they give us. Yeah. Every other number we have to define. And we want to talk about some. They give us 1 and 0, and they give us the notion of plus and times. That's what you start with in arithmetic. These are the only two numbers you start with. These are the only two operations you start with. We want to talk about the number 2. It's a useful number, right? Mm -hmm. So by definition, we define 2 to be 1 plus 1. What's the definition of 2? 1 plus 1. That is its definition. And now we can define 3. What is 3? 1 plus 2. 2 plus 1. Or 1 plus 2, same thing. It's given as our axioms that addition is commutative and associative, multiplication is commutative and associative, and this and your distribution pro properties. Basically, these properties for multiplication and addition are the axioms on the real numbers that you start with. So you know that order doesn't matter with plus. That's one of the things you're given. There's 10 axioms you're given. Those are some of them. All right, that's what 3 is. What's 4? It's going to be 3 plus 1. Now we can prove something. I can prove 2 plus 2 is 4. How would I prove 2 plus 2 is 4? 
2 plus 1. 2 plus 2 is equal to 2 plus 2. Then I use the fact that addition is associative. This is equal to That's using associativity of addition. I can put the parentheses wherever I want. That's one of our axioms. 2 plus 1 by definition is? 3. 3. So this is 3 plus 1. 3 plus 1 by definition is? 4. 4. four. There we go. You finally have seen a proof that 2 plus 2 is 4. And that's how you would prove 2 plus 2 is 4. And doing this doesn't work. Look, look, now count. <laughs> All you show me is that 2 fingers plus 2 fingers is 4 fingers. Well, if we were counting elephants. Or if we're counting bricks. Does that still work? How do you know it works? So no, sticking up your fingers isn't a proof. So this is how we can start talking about all the other numbers. So you see how we can talk about 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the naturals. Now the next types of numbers we would want to talk about would be negative numbers. How would we talk about negative numbers? And so one of our axioms when you're doing arithmetic is that for every x, for every x, there exists a y such that x plus y gives you the additive identity, zero. All right. So the way we define negative three now is it's the unique solution to this equation. One of our axioms guarantees us that there is a solution to that equation. You'd have to do as a side proof, and there's only one solution to that equation. That would be a proof by contradiction. Let's assume that there's two solutions. Okay, these are the contradiction, therefore there's only one. So negative 3 is a unique solution to this equation. So by definition, negative 3 is the x that makes this statement true. That's what it is. But how do we get that? We don't make the symbols yet. Well, we can make up a symbol now. So I make up, I'm going to make up a special symbol for the solution to that thing. I may call it negative x, or negative 3. And in general, if I have x plus y equal to 0, the unique y that makes that true, I'm just going to call negative x. That's its definition. What's negative x? It's the solution to this equation. So a little bit of side work to prove that there's one and only one solution to that equation. Once you have it, we define that to be negative x. Now we can define it subtraction. What does it mean to do x minus y? By definition, that would be x plus negative y. And that's how we would define subtraction, using negative numbers. So what does it mean to do 3 minus 5? It means to do 3 plus negative 5. Or another way that we say it is 3 plus 5's additive inverse. We do some of this in logic, but no, this is arithmetic. That's what we call the additive inverse. The thing that you add to x to get the additive identity is the additive inverse. So negative 5 is 5 additive inverse, and 5 is negative 5's additive inverse. And so that's how we get our negative numbers. What about multiplication and division now? Well, if I wanted to talk about the number 1 half, what on earth is that number? Well, the same way that we have a statement like this, we have for all x, there exists a y such that x times y is equal to 1. And it's for all x where x is not 0. Let me make that specification. For all x where x isn't 0, remember 0 is one of the initial numbers we knew about, so we can talk about it in our axioms. For every x where x isn't 0, there does exist a y such that x times y equals 1. We call y the multiplicative inverse of x. And we often represent it the same way that we use this for the additive inverse of x. We often use this for the multiplicative inverse of x. The same way that I know x plus its additive inverse is 0, I know x times its multiplicative inverse is 1. That gives me additive identity. That gives me multiplicative identity. And that's how we define these things. So when I say now, I want to define, what do we mean by x divided by y? What we define that to mean is this is x times y's multiplicative inverse. Every number has a multiplicative inverse except 0, so you can't divide by 0. Dividing by 0 is the same thing as multiplying by 0's multiplicative inverse. It doesn't happen. It's the only number that doesn't happen. 
So when you say something like, what's 2, or what's 10 divided by 2, something like that, what you're asking is, what is 10 times 1 half? The multiple give inverse of 2, which is 5. That's why I always say division is really just multiplication. And so we'll do a similar thing in our modular arithmetic when we want to find division. So we're going to have to define subtraction. We'll define it in terms of plusing. And then we're going to have to define division. And we're going to define it in terms of multiplying. And we're going to do something similar. We're going to say that when we're talking about a divided by b, this is going to be a times b's multiplicative inverse. And we're going to have to be able to figure out what that multiplicative inverse is. And believe it or not, Euclid's algorithm is going to help us do that. <laughs> and that's why Euclid's extended algorithm is so useful. Somehow this is related to finding solutions to the equation ax plus by equals 1. And we'll make that make sense next time. <laughs> but you see the equaling 1 coming up there kind of makes sense. Because what does a multiplicative inverse do? It makes like your product is 1. So that's how that one showing up there is going to be useful. Anyways, some high level talking about where we're going. We'll actually get there next week. Rest of class to, uh, you can go on break. You can uh, do homework.